all right, man, is that song not incredible, right? Uh, just listen to that. When I call on Jesus, I love that. It's like, uh, things look really bad, but when I call on Jesus, right? I mean, that's exactly where we are. and That's what we've got. And so this is where we're going today. We're going to look at, uh, at prayer. It's one of the aspects of old school. And so uh, before we do that, we're going to do what we always do. We're just going to pray and ask God to speak to us. So you do that where you are. I'm going to do it right here where I am. And uh, we're going to jump into some truth this morning. Well, we sung praise to your name, and we have reminded ourselves of your greatness, that you are our hope, that uh, you, Father, can turn graves into gardens, and that when we call on you, uh, things change. And so, Lord, as we open up your word today, uh, we ask that the Spirit of the living God would have his way in our life, that, Father, you would transform us, that you would change us, that we would be forever altered for having spent the moments that we are right now listening to your truth as it's presented from your word. So have your way in our life this day, Father, we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We are in a series, and it is by far, uh, I say this about every series, I guess, but it's by far one of my favorites. Um, this truth is what is saturating my life right now. I'm, I'm in the middle of, I think I've told you, writing a book called Immerse. Uh, but it really is a journey for people to, uh, long after I'm gone, Lord willing, people can read this book and understand. And it's like a road map to what God is doing in our life and what God wants to do. I think the church in America these days and in large part around the world has turned church into an event and turned salvation into something uh, that, that it's not, that it's meant to just give us our best life now, that Jesus is going to come and he's just going to fix everything. And, and, and that's, a, that's a cheap gospel. It's a cheap way of understanding things. And so what we want to do is immerse ourselves into the Christian life. And how, do we, how, do we, how are we awakened all the way through? And what is the goal here? What, what's the what's the plan? Am I just I got my ticket to heaven? I'm gonna sit at the bus stop and I'm gonna try and behave until the the uh, heaven train and the uh, the bus to heaven comes and picks us up and takes us home. What what what's going on here? Is that all I'm doing? I'm just gonna be good in the process, or is there a purpose behind what's going on? Is there something bigger than maybe that we have imagined? And so uh, these are the things that we want to talk about. And these are the things that we've been talking about. And so we have called this old school. I have uh, taught something similar to this before, and I think we called it uh, Back to the Basics. Uh, the book that I'm writing is called Immerse, uh, because that's what I see it. It's an immersion into a whole new way of life, a whole other dimension of life. And so it's just this uh, complete overhaul, a transformation that takes place. And so this is the series. We Several years ago, if you've been with me for years, uh, we talked about uh, the becoming, the caterpillar to the butterfly, and that great transformation that takes place when a caterpillar is just doing his thing. He's just he's a leaf muncher. That's all he does. He just munches leaves, right? He just That's all he does. And then it, at one point in his life, he, uh, he begins to take a nap, if you will, and and a cocoon is woven around him. And, and as he wakes up, he is nothing like what he was when he fell asleep. When he was awakened he, and he stretched uh, his little legs out, they weren't little legs. They were wings and they were beautiful. And, and he was able to fly things that he had never thought that, that he would be able to do again. And there was this moment where he was in awe of what God had done. And, and that's the scriptures. That when, behold, in, in Christ, we're new creations. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And, and that's who we are. And so we've been looking at that. And, and God has, has, is transforming us from the self-absorbed life to the set-free life. You see, being selfish is a prison. Self-absorption is a prison. It causes you to see less in life 
than you possibly could it because it all becomes about you and your the smallness of your world and so what god is doing is he has moved us from this self-absorption to the idea of being set free to be able to live really the life that God has called us to live. And so this is where we're going. And we looked at the first week of the gospel and understanding what that is, that, that God is holy and just. And we, because of Adam and Eve's sin, inherited everything opposite of that. And so there is this gap between us and God. God is on one side and we are on the other. And, and there is a separation between us. And my sin and your sin is what made that separation. It doesn't matter whether you, your sin in your world is considered small or they're massive. The greatest to the smallest is sufficient enough to cause that gap. And that gap is our problem because God is on one side and we are on the other. And and so we needed a way across the gap. And there was no way that we could do it on our own because our sins, the wages of our sins is death. And so we have to have a way. We're, we're dead. We're, we're in trouble. That's when God shows up through Christ. He walks perfect among us, crucified, resurrected, and now offering us life in him. And so uh, we say, well, how, then that's the gospel, but how does, it, how does it become a part of my life? Well, it's by grace and it's by faith. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, made us alive. So what must we do to be saved? What do I do? Do I need to walk an aisle? Do I, do I need to get somebody to come pray over me? Do I, uh, do, do, what, what do I need to do? Well, the answer in the scriptures consistently is that we repent and we believe, that, that we repent, that we realize that the way we've been going is wrong. The way that we've been going is self-destructive. The way that we've been going is self-absorbed. The way that we've been going is away from God. And so when we awaken to the gospel, when we hear it for the first time, and, and, and it, it, it opens our eyes and we begin to see it and there begins to be a hunger for it, then there is a repentance. There is a turning around. There is a, I was going in this direction and now I'm going to go in this direction. And so it is that is repentance, to have a, a change of mind, to, which always brings about a change of heart and a, a, a different sort of action. And so these are the things that it, that it does. That's repentance, and then we believe. So repentance is, is a, like confession. We confess to God our need for Him. Believe is that we believe that He has remedied our situation. Believe involves three things, right? And we've looked at this consistently. It involves a set of facts. We have to know who God is. We have to know who Jesus is. Someone has to tell us about him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. And so someone tells us. We read it in our, on our own in the Bible or somebody tells us. However it works, we are told. And we believe. And we, so we've gained facts. And so we have knowledge now. Then we believe that those facts are true, that it is actual truth, and it is for me. That, that means I assent to that. I, I believe that that is true, and then I live my life based on it. So then I, I begin to live like that. And when we believe, that's what it means. It's the simple truth. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him won't perish but have eternal life. And so we saw that that gospel is an awakening, and, that, and that's what takes place. And when that awakening happens, there's a transformation, just like the caterpillar. When, when we were awakened and we confessed our sins and we repented of our sins and we believe uh, that Jesus is Lord and, and we live our life on that and we give to him our life, we say, Lord, here am I. This is my life. Take it and use it. Uh, when we do that, there's a transformation that takes place. The old man has been uh, ripped off the seat of the throne of our heart. Christ has come to seat himself there. And there's a transformation that begins to take place. What happens is there's evidence that that has happened in my life. If old things pass away, behold, all things become new. Then what do those new things look like? Well, we looked at that in one of the weeks as we were going through this series here. We saw where there is a desire now for us to do the Word. John says that we know we're passing death life because we keep His commandments. Because there's this, 
there's this uh, tarao, there's this this urging, there's this want to, there's this desire to do the word. And so we find that that's true of us. And then we find that that um, our eyes have drifted off of ourselves and they begin to be drifting toward others. And so there's this love that's, that's indescribable. It's not a love that, it's not just brotherly love. It's not just love that that I've normally loved with. It, it is an agape love. It's a God love. And there's something that's pouring out of me that I hadn't had before. And if these things are yours, then you know and you have assurance that you're one of his, that, that you really are saved. And, and, and we saw where there is the, the leaving of the world. When, when you begin to see things of the world and go, it just it doesn't have the same appeal as it used to anymore. I mean, I, I'm not so into all of that stuff. There's something powerful going on. That's God who is now seated on your throne of your heart, leading you and transforming you. And it has to do with breaking free. We find ourselves uh, breaking free from sin and its stronghold and and, and we're beginning to, to pursue holiness. This is what it is. Well, then we also looked at the benefits and what happened when we came to Christ? Well, we were, we were justified. Uh, we were forgiven. Uh, we were made alive. Uh, we were adopted. We were accepted. We were brought into the household of God. These are all the things we've been talking about. We become children of God. And, and, and we have heaven as our inheritance. These are the things that we have. It's an incredible deal. God's grace is always with me. I am being constantly bathed uh, in forgiveness. The blood of his son constantly cleanses me from all sin. God no longer holds me accountable for my sins. It's an amazing thing. One of the chief benefits that took place too is the Holy Spirit began to take residence in our life. And so he is in us. God in you. That's the message of the gospel. When you were transformed, when you were awakened and you got saved, the spirit of the living God came to dwell within you, was poured on you. You were saturated. You were immersed into a whole new way of life. And that seed of the spirit that's in you is bearing fruit. So what's happening in you is that as as you allow the spirit of God to, to, to really kind of take complete control of your life, to let the, let him be Lord of your life, you begin to see things. It's like a seed planted in the ground, and as it grows and it's, it's watered, and as sunlight hits it, uh, then fruit begins to, to be shown. And so our lives begin to be transformed, and, and we become uh, loving and joyful, peaceful, patient. We become good and kind. Uh, we, we become uh, grateful. We become all of these. We become self-controlled. It's, we've, we've locked self up, and, and this, is, this is what goes on. And, and then we're gifted. God, he, he takes a manifestation of who he is, and he gives it to us. So he is the teacher, but then he also gifts others with that ability. He is the leader, yet he gifts those with some of those abilities. He is the servant, and yet he gifts those with the ability to serve. And so, so there's this multifaceted thing that takes place. And these are all tools that God is using as he's transforming us to be valuable to him in the service of God. And then we saw the word of God and how powerful it is and, and how it's withstood the test of time and and it is true, whether men believe it or not, we know it to be so. It's, it's verified scientifically and archaeologically, if you will. It's verified by the transformations of people who have read it. The testimony of the saints scream that this book is true because we have seen it played out in our lives. And that word of God is what feeds us. It is, it is how God speaks to us in primary ways. And it is, it, is the, it is the word of God that, that as we hunger for it, it begins to change us in ways that, that nothing else can. It's like no surgeon. The, he, it, the word of God can reach places in your life that, that nothing else can, can touch. And so we looked at that. And, and uh, then we looked at the transformation of holiness. Holiness is, is God in me. That's what the Spirit's doing. Righteousness is what happens as I, my actions begin to change. And so we're told, and we looked at that for two weeks about transformation, that we're to put off the old man, 
which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, be made new in the attitude of our mind through the Spirit and through the Word of God and through the, the brotherhood of Christ. And, and, that, and that in that transformation, then we're to put on the new self. And so we look practically at what that looked like, how we no longer just work so that we can hoard, but that we, we work so we can have something to give, that we no longer just say what we think, but, but we actually try to use words that edify and build up, and we withhold words that, that don't do that. And we went through the whole litany of those things in, in Ephesians chapter 4. Today I want to bring another element into it, and it is this concept of prayer, that when we call on Jesus, right, and this is... This is the power of transformation. Prayer is the most humbling thing that you and I can ever do. Because when we pray, we are admitting that we need help. That we, of our own strength, can't do what we need to do. So we need to call on Jesus. And God says he's opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So prayer is ultimately a way to invite the grace of God into our life. I, I give prayer this definition. Prayer is inviting the presence of Almighty God into my life. That's what, it, that's what prayer is. It's, I'm inviting Almighty God to do something in little old myself's life on this planet. This is what it is. It's, it's a, and it's a tool that we have. It's a gift from God, this concept of prayer. It's an open invitation for God to change me to change my situation, to change you, and maybe to give me grace. And so that's what that's what prayer is. And so what I want to do is kind of paint a, a little picture, show you how the Trinity kind of works itself in prayer, have a conversation about it, and then we'll rock on throughout this day. But uh, Hebrews chapter 4 is a powerful section that just reminds me of so many things. It's the picture that I have in my head as I move about to pray uh, throughout the day. When I, when I go into my prayer closet, if you will, when I go into the, the stone yard where, where I'm still working or, or I retreat into my, my, my study, uh, this is what I see. And it's out of the book of Hebrews. There's two passages. I want to read them and then just have some comment for you because we pray to God. That's who we pray to. Some people don't know this, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you, and we're going to look at it. I pray to God, the Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. All, all of the triune aspect of God is brought to bear in this thing called prayer. And so we are praying to the Father. We are praying to the God Most High. There is no one higher than that. You know, if you've ever had any trouble, we had some trouble the other day with some um, entity. We were renting uh, a place, and we were not getting our money. And uh, so we, we called and said, hey, look, there's an issue here. And, and we could only get so far with that person. Hey, is there somebody above you I can talk to, right? And so you go through that series, right? You've done the same thing, right? You try to just get up the chain. Is there a manager here? Well, is the owner here, right? Well, we bypass all that in prayer. We go straight to the top to the creator of the universe, to the one who owns everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the earth and everything in it is his, and as well as the universe. And so this is what he says. Hebrews 14, uh, uh, the writer to the Hebrews is letting us know this. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, when we, if we were listening to this as good Hebrews, we would understand that in the temple, there are these outer courts and inner courts, and then you get to the Holy of Holies. And the only one, that's where God was. That's where the ark was. Um, that's, where, uh, that's where he dwelt. And so the priest would be the only one who could go in there and offer a sacrifice. Uh, and, and he would do that in fear and trembling because there may have been sin in his own life. And so he would, he would in trepidation 
go into that holy of holies on our behalf to offer a sacrifice. The scripture says now Jesus has offered that once for all sacrifice. So so it's done. It, there's no he doesn't have to keep going before us. He he accomplished that. And what happened and that's why at the at the at the crucifixion that veil was ripped in two because the sacrifice was accepted. And so now there is no separation between us and God. Christ has bridged that gap. And so when we pray he says and let us draw boldly to the throne of heaven. And he goes on to say in chapter uh, or, or uh, yeah, ch uh, chapter chapter 10, he says this, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This picture that I have is God on his throne. And there is no wall that separates me so that I, I, I can't get there anymore. Christ has, has paved the way. He has opened the door. He has torn the veil. And so now God the Father, because I've become one of his children, he is Abba, Father. He, he's, he belong, he's my father. I'm his child. And so I can run boldly into his throne room and I can sit down in the proverbial lap of the creator of the most high and I can tell him my troubles. See, this is, this is the power of, of, of what we're talking about. There is this holy of holies. I can tell him my hopes and my dreams. I, I can tell him my fears and I can, I can share my tears with him. I can, and, he, and the scriptures even say that he... He captures those tears in, in bottles, so to speak, in, in little bottles. This is how much he treasures that time that we have. And this is why we should know what's going on when we pray. It's where I confess my sins and my failures. It's where I ask for divine assistance. There are times you go in there and you're like, I'm not even sure what to pray. Man, I, my mind is so messed up right now. Lord, I don't even know what to pray and this is where the Spirit comes in. See, we, we, we have access straight to the Father. Take advantage of that. You know people, right? You know, you say, well, I know people. Right, I can help you. I know people. No, I know Him. I know Him. I know God the Father. And I'm able to run into that throne room. And I'm able to jump up in that lap, bow before Him, whatever my posture is, and cry out to Him. And I do so in the power of the Spirit. The, Paul told the Ephesian church, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. What's he saying? Pray at all times in the Spirit. What does that mean? In line with the Spirit. As the Spirit lives in us, and we are in his, his goal is to uh, help us put off the flesh, to put on the Spirit, to rid ourselves of sin, to put on righteousness, and, and so we are getting in my, we are letting the spirit coach us, guide us, teach us. And so when we pray in the spirit, we pray like that. And there are times the scripture says that the spirit will even intercede for us on our behalf. So when we're in that room, the spirit in us is in that room and he's, he's crying out to the father also on our behalf with words that we can't, they're too deep for words. You, you, he speaks a language that beyond words, yet he and the father understand those things. And so See, when I go to pray, there's two sides, right? I can pray in the flesh or I can pray in the spirit. I can pray selfishly or I can pray in the spirit. That's why we say, Lord, your will be done. That's why the Lord said to pray that way. Not my will, your will. I can share with them the desires of my heart, but prayer is about getting God's desire in my heart, not so much mine. Because if his desire is in there, I will have great delight. So this is the way it works. And then we pray... Uh, in, in Jesus' name. Now let's talk about what that means. Jesus says in John 14, 14, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And then he says, uh, verse chapter 16, in that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive it, that your joy may be full. When we say in Jesus' name, 
that what what we're saying is as though Jesus were were here, right? Lord, give me power to do this in Jesus' name, because I, I, if if Jesus were here, that that's what He would do. I, in the place as a representative of Jesus, I'm asking you these things on behalf of Jesus. I'm asking you these things, and so this is what it is. And we pray in Jesus' name, in the power of His name, in 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 trying to please Him. These are the things we and, and when we pray. We are inviting, this is crazy stuff, but we are inviting God into our situation. And oftentimes, He uses angels to minister and to do those things. And it's crazy how that happens. I've told this story before. I'm going to read it to you again. Uh, Daniel, chapter 9. He's crying out, and uh, it says, he says, well, uh, chapter 9, he, he's been praying a season of prayer. Uh, this is the first year of, of, of King Darius, and he says this, While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord, my God, for the holy hill of my God. Right? So he's just crying out for God. He's crying out for his confession, his sins. He's confessing his people's sins. He's, he's crying out for God to take territory. This is what he's doing. And it says, While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, an angel, Gabriel, who appeared in the form of a man, whom I had seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He's praying, looks up, here comes Gabriel flying to him. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, Oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out. And I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the world and understand the vision. Is that not, is that not crazy? You got that picture? Let me give you one more, and we're going to bring it, all that together. So he goes on, in the third year of Cyrus, this is some several years have passed by, and Daniel's praying again. Then he said to me, so he's praying, asking about help and understanding end times and those things like that. And so then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard. And I have become because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and I came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. Do you get this picture? What's going on? When you and me walk into that holy of holies, and from where we our vantage point, we cry out to him. It's as though the creator of the Most High, sitting on that throne, Look at the angels who were there surrounding him and who are ministers sent to minister to you and me. They're servants that God extends to you and to me to meet our needs. A word goes forth from the Father's mouth and he speaks and the angels hear it. You heard it both times in both instances. That's what took place. A word went forth and I heard it and here I am. God said this and here I am to deliver the message. And they begin to get about heavenly activity and they're going to even meet obstacles. You don't think prayer is, is, is warfare? When we pray, the angels are scurrying and so are the demons and there's a clash in the, in the unseen world as, as, the, as the demons are opposing those prayers that you and I are praying. But God always is victorious in those things. And so uh, we, we, we have the privilege as believers of calling on God as those before us have. There was a time when Joshua was chasing his enemies uh, and he was he was routing them, but he needed more time for the sun was going down. And he knew when the sun went down, he couldn't complete the task. And so he cries out for God to, to let the sun stand still. And the sun stood still. Listen, when you call on Jesus, right? I mean, when you, when you call on the God Most High, there's no limit to what he can do. And Elijah... When he was standing on that mountainside and all of the prophets of Baal are there and he calls down fire from heaven and it laps up all of the sacrifice after they had tried and got nowhere. 
You see, prayer is something that's powerful, and I don't think we take advantage of it. We, we get too silly with our prayers. We think we're commanding and demanding, and we think we're stomping around and doing all these things. We are the people of God who humble ourselves and have access into the very presence of God, undeserved. And his ear is ever attentive to our cry because he's brought us into his household. And so if I need wisdom in how to deal with and maneuver things, I can pray and he'll give me wisdom. James says that. If any of you like wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men richly. And so, so we can pray for wisdom. Do you need wisdom today? This is the beauty of the Christian life. This is what it means to be immersed into into the life of Christ. We have access to God. And I can pray and wisdom comes my way. I don't need, I mean, there's abundance in counselors, but I don't need to read a hundred books. I don't need to go spend all my money in counseling. I need the wisdom from God. And I can get it. And I pray about those things. I get strength from God. There are times when I'm worn out. And I can say, Lord, man, I need, I need some strength here. You begin to find that strength to do those things which you didn't think you, you could do, right? And I need strength to pray, and, I mean, to preach sometimes. I need strength to have hard conversations sometimes. I need, because there's some trembling that can go on in our life, isn't there? Sometimes we need strength. We're going into the, you know, the, the hospital or we're going into the doctor's office. We've heard bad news. We need strength, don't we? We just need God to strengthen us. I listen, I've been I have stood on the brink of too many disasters, most of the ones that I created, and I'm having to call out for strength. I can ask God to speak to me. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I can I can tell God, hey God, I, I I'm ready to be used by you. I'd like can I can I get in the game? Can is there a spot for me on the team? What what can I do? I, I can pray those things. And God will give me an opportunity to do ministry. You, you don't get where you are. You, 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 man, you screwed up too many times. There's no ministry for you. Not true. Don't let anybody tell you that. It, this, is, this is how we pray. We just let them know we're available. I, I want to I end, end with uh, just really a reading of the Lord's Prayer because it's powerful. And I'm going to let you go. And we're going to get on with our day. But it says... Uh, when, the, when they asked the Lord to teach us to pray, this is what they said. He said, well, when you pray, pray like this. Don't, don't, don't pray like, don't quit looking at all those other guys that are showing you how to pray. This is what I want you to do. I want you to say, our Father who art in heaven. Holy is your name. What's he saying there? First, why don't you just take a minute and absorb and declare who you know God to be. That he is the God of all grace. That he is the God of who sees me. He is the God who fights my battles for me. He is my provider. Holy is His name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. God, I'm going to bring you my vantage point. I'm not smart enough to know if that's what you want or not, but I'm going to share with you my heart. I'm going to ask you for some things. But God, I, I, I want your will to be done because I believe that whatever it is you want, is going to be better for me than what I want. And so, Lord, you, you, you make this decision. You close the doors, Father. You open the doors. I'm going to stand here and wait for that to happen because I want your will to be done. When we start praying like this, heaven moves. And then he says this, give us this day our daily bread. Father, would you just meet my needs today, Father? I'm not asking for, you know, I just, I just want today taken care of i'm not gonna worry about tomorrow i'm not gonna worry about yesterday today father can you meet my needs will you do what i need done today isn't this powerful when we start praying like this already was i as i read through this i feel a contentment and a peace that, that comes on me and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors oh yeah father i just want to let you know thank you for for the forgiveness of my sins and i confess these to you today and I know that I've got some attitudes and issues toward others. And I want you to know, Father, I'm forgiving them of their debt. I'm not going to hold them to a debt that you don't hold me to. And so we're done with that, Father. I'm laying them aside. And he said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, don't let me stray into places that I don't need to go. 
man, if you and me were to pray those prayers, this prayer in that way and, and be specific about it, it's a game changer, isn't it? Man. Uh, listen, this is called transformation. This is what it looks like. I'm glad you came today and we could have this conversation. I want to um, pray with us and then we're going to worship our way out of here. Father, thank you for the day, for truth, for the way you've met our needs. This day, Father, we invite you to have your way. We trust you. We love you. Thank you for this power of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, you guys have a great week. I'll be talking to you soon.